Chapter 17, Isabel, The Straits of Florida, Somewhere North of Cuba, 1994, One Day from Home. Isabel watched as Papi, Senor Castello, Luis Sinamara huddled over the boat engine, trying to figure out why it wouldn't start. It had something to do with it overheating. Senor Castello had said, Amara was pouring sea water over it, trying to cool it. Meanwhile, Ivan and Isabel had been tasked with scooping the water back out of the bottom of the boat. The sock stuffed into the bullet hole was soaked through, and it drip, drip, dripped water onto Castro's face at the bottom of the boat like a leak, leaky faucet. They had been drifting north in the Gulf Stream with the motor, motor silent for more than an hour now, and no one was singing or dancing or laughing any more. Ahead of Isabel, her mother and Senora Castello slept against each other on the narrow bench at the front of the boat, where the prow came to a point. Lido sat on the middle bench right above Isabel and Ivan. You do have family in Miami, Isabel's grandfather told her as she and Ivan worked. When that news lady asked you if you had family in El Norte, you said no, but you do, Lido said. My brother, Guillermo. Isabel and Ivan looked up at each other in surprise. I didn't know you had a brother, Isabel said to her grandfather. He left in the airlifts in the 1970s, the freedom flights when the U.S. airlifted political descendants off the island, Lido explained. But Guillermo was no descendant. He just wanted to live in the United States. I could have gone too. I was a police officer once, like Luis and Amara. Did you know that? Back before Castro, when Bastista was president? Isabel knew that, and that Lido had lost his job during the revolution and had been sent to cut cane in the fields instead. I could have pulled strings, Lido said, called in favors, got me and your grandmother off the island. Then you would have been born in El Norte, Ivan told Isabel. She paused in her scooping, thinking how different her life might be right now. Born in the United States? It was almost inconceivable. We stayed because Cuba was our home, Lito said. I didn't leave when Castro took over in 1959. I didn't leave when the United States sent planes in the 70s. I didn't leave in the 80s when all those people sailed out of Merrill Harbor. Lito shook his head at the tight cluster of people worrying over the engine at the back of the boat and thumped his fist against the side. It was a mistake leaving on this sinking coffin. I should have stayed put. All of us should have. How is Cuba worse now than it ever was? We're always been beholden to somebody else. First it was Spain, then it was the United States, then it was Russia, first Bastista, then Castro. We should have waited. Things change. They always change. But do they ever get better? Ivan asked. Isabel thought that was a good question. All her life, things had only gotten worse. First the Soviet Union collapsing, then her parents fighting, then her father trying to leave, then her grandmother dying. She waited for Lito to tell her different, to tell her that things would get better. But he looked out at the black water instead. Isabel and Ivan shared a glance. Lito's silence was answer enough. Someone would have done something, Lito said at last. We should have waited. But they were going to arrest Poppy, said Isabel. I know you love your father, Chabella, but he's a fool. Isabel's cheeks burned hot with anger and embarrassment. She loved Lito, but she loved her Poppy too, and she hated to hear Lito say bad things about him. But even worse, he was saying things in front of her best friend. She glanced quickly at Ivan. He kept his eyes on his work, pretending not to have heard. But they were right at Lido's feet. He could hear everything, and Lido wasn't finished. He's risking his life for this. He's risking your life and your mother's life and his unborn born child's life. And for what? Lido asked. He doesn't even know. He can't say. Ask him why he wants to go to the States, and all he can say is freedom? That's not a plan. How's he going to put a roof over your head and food on your table any better than he did in Cuba? Lido raised his eyebrows at Isabel. He's taking you away from who you are, what you are. How are you ever going to learn to count Clave in Miami? 
The U.S. has no soul. In Havana, you would have learned it without even trying. Clave is the hidden heartbeat of people beneath whatever song Bastita or Castro is playing. Oh, hush, Poppy, Isabel's mother said sleepily. She had been awake enough to hear them after all, at least the last part. Miami is just north of Cuba. Miami shifted and went back to sleep. But Isabel worried that Lido was right. She had never been able to count Clave, but she had always assumed it would come to her eventually, that the rhythm of her homeland would one day whisper its secrets to her soul. But would she ever hear it now? Like trading her trumpet? Had she swapped the one thing that was really hers, her music, for the chance to keep her family together? We should go back, Lido said. He wobbled to his feet. We're not far gone, and with Castro being so lenient right now, we won't be punished for leaving. No, Lido, Isabel said. No, as much as she feared the loss of her music, her soul, she wouldn't trade that for her family. She grabbed Lido and held him back. Don't. We can't go back. They'll arrest Poppy. Panic rose like the distant rumble of thunder in Isabel's ears, but then Ivan and Lido both looked up like they could hear it too. It wasn't Isabel's fear that shook her deep down to the pit of her stomach. It was the enormous tanker headed right for them.